Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfeld, and you're watching Back to the Bible Canada. And it's so delightful to have you with me. Um, we're doing a uh, studies through the Scripture and uh, things that we can learn by looking at various passages of Scripture. And today, I want to speak about Abraham, start a series on Abraham, and tell you why I think this is about as significant as I can think about. See, every once in a while, I'll get into a conversation with uh, someone, maybe a group of people, and they'll say, look, I mean, I get that, you know, Christians are monotheistic and that they, you know, they think that, you know, they're right and everybody else is wrong. And how can you actually say that, though, given a world where we have endless possibilities of different belief structures and, uh, you know, we're becoming more aware of how different people around the world are? How can you possibly say, you know, you're right and everyone else is wrong? So normally, I love that kind of a conversation because it gets us talking about what are the possibilities in terms of belief structures. So, you know, people around the world, there are a given group of people who are what we would call naturalists. They don't believe there's any God, there's anything outside of nature. Can't prove that. They do believe that. They think that's right and everybody else is wrong, see? And then there are those people who actually believe that there is but one God, count myself there. Then there are people who are polytheists that think there are many gods. Uh, and, and then there are people, you know, such as uh, Buddhists and Hindus uh, in the world who believe that there is a, you know, a one essence that fills the earth, and that one essence is not a personal god, but it's simply a force. Kind of if you think about the Star Wars force, something like that, and so whenever you speak about gods and goddesses, those are just emanations of that one impersonal force that pervades everything. So there's that as a worldview as well. But when it comes to the idea that there is but one God who created all things, and by the way, the evidence for that is getting stronger and stronger all of the time. And I say that simply because um, more and more we have come to realize that all things had a point of beginning. And if all things had a point of beginning, I mean, where in the world did matter come from? Does that not of itself necessitate a creator? So the idea that there is intelligent design, that there's one creator, that there is a God who oversees all things, I mean, that's not uh, you know, a way out there proposition. That seems to me the most obvious of all propositions. So if you hold that to be true, you might ask yourself, well, okay, if you only believe in one God, uh, surely the world is filled with different possibilities as to who that one God is. And here's this little known secret, or maybe it should be a well-known secret. When it comes to who is that one God, there are no options. <laughs> And I say that because I get got to think about that, and it, it, it's got to somehow uh, just impact you. You would think in a world of over 7 billion people, wherein half of the population, a little bit more than half the population, believes there is but one and only one God, that the options of as to who that one God is, there are no options but that that one God is the God of Abraham. And I say that because if you think about the monotheistic religions of the world, they are called the Abrahamic faiths. So there's uh, Judaism and Christianity and Islam. Now, I know that Sikhism is a minor religion, and it also holds to one God. Uh, Sikhism comes out of Hinduism, where they really want to do away with that caste system and the inherent racism that is in that kind of a system. And so they want to do away with that. And they come into contact with Muslims who, from the Muslims, they learn that there is but one God. Well, which God do the Muslims worship? And the answer is, well, they worship the God of Abraham. You see, here's what I'm saying. Even though there are, you know, a minor religion like, like Sikhism that's out there, and yet still we need to recognize that all monotheistic religions in the world believe that the one true God is Abraham's God. Now, I had that conversation with someone not, not long ago, and he said, well, that's no big deal. And I said, how is that not a big deal? I mean, you would think, given that 
You know, in a world of choices after choices after choices, when we talk about who is God, and in the end of the day, there are no choices, but there's only one choice before us, that in and of itself is not only impressive, but that's earth shattering. It it makes us stop and say, what in the world just happened here? The other thing I like to say is that um, in, you know, in Canadian school system, uh, no matter what it is that we discuss, most Canadian children go through school system and never have actually studied the person of Abraham. And that should shock us because the person of Abraham has clearly impacted and directed one half of the earth's population. That's not a minor oversight. That is a major emission. That's a glaring blindness. I guess what I'm trying to say in the end of the day that a, a, a series on the person of Abraham is as foundational for the human race as we can possibly think. So that's what this is all about. It's a study of Abraham's life, at least sections of Abraham's life, and learning what it is that we can learn from that. So uh, let's, let's begin here. And what I'm going to do is begin not with chapter 12, which is typically uh, Genesis chapter 12, which is typically where we find the story of Abraham beginning, but I wanna go back to chapter 11. Um, imagine you go to a movie and uh, you get there 10 minutes late. And that movie was so constructed that the first 10 minutes of the movie set the stage for everything that's going to happen. So if you got there 10 minutes late, you, 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 you didn't get the central issue of the plot. And so after that, you know, you, you saw events happen, but you weren't able to put it all together. It's because you missed the first 10 minutes. Well, I'm going to say that the last verses of Genesis chapter 11 set the stage for the life of Abraham, and it sets the stage in such a way that everything that happens to Abraham after this point in time and how what happens to him will impact the entire earth, everything that happens at this one point in time uh, is, is based on those few verses that we get in chapter 11. So let me begin by reading the text and it's Genesis 11, verse 27, all the way to the end of the passage, uh, or the end of the chapter, I should say. All right, here we go. It says, now these are the generations of Terah. Man's name is Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Well, you know, you've got a bunch of names of people that you might not be familiar with, and you've got a number of locations around the earth, and you might say, man, I, I don't know anything about, you know, Ur of the Chaldeans or Haran or wherever these places were or why that's even significant. So we tend to, when we come to a text like that, just simply skip beyond it and Let's get to the meat of the story. Let's find out why this man, Abraham, changed the world. Or as he's actually called here, Abram. He's called Abram early on. And then at one point in time, he will encounter God and God will change his name from Abram to Abraham. We'll, we'll get to that. But for now, let's just notice a couple of things about this. You see, first of all, the story begins with a man by the name of Terah. What is it we actually know about that man? Well, we know that he lived in a place called Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, Ur of the Chaldeans is not like saying, you know, once upon a time in the land of Hashemai, there lived a man by the name of Terah. No, 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 Ur of the Chaldeans was a place that actually existed. So if you want to know where that, it doesn't exist today, but if you want to know where that ancient city was located, it was located in what is now known as Southern Iraq. And archaeologists have been there, and they have uncovered, they've done a major dig of Ur of the Chaldeans, and they have found about 100,000 clay tablets filled with writing uh, from the city at the time of Abraham, or at the time of Abram, or at the time of Terah, and they give us an incredible insight as to what life was like during that time. 
Well, uh, during that time, and you might say, well, what was that time? And so let me give you the dates of Abraham. Abraham's life was from 2166 BC uh, all the way to 1991 BC. So, you know, there are the dates. So it's a story that's more than 4,000 years old. So let me tell you about a city that existed some 4,000 years ago. We know that the city was massive in that time period. It probably had about 250,000 people. So in the ancient world, that would be a massive, massive city, certainly one of the largest cities on earth at that time. And it had an economy which was vibrant. It depended on commerce and it depended on manufacturing. And that's because the city of Ur of the Chaldeans used the Persian Gulf as an export import highway, and they traded with people all over the world as far away as India, and they traded in expensive jewels and uh, expensive cloth, all sorts of things. I mean, they became the trading capital of the world. Uh, We know that at the time of Terah, when Abram lived there, that the city was right then in an economic boom. And uh, to put it in our terms, uh, everything was flourishing. Uh, The economy was cooking. Uh, The arts were everywhere. Literature, vast libraries were found there. The study of law and uh, the establishment of law, poetry, uh, music, the civilization was at its peak. It was in that time period, most likely the leading city of the world. Now think about that in our terms. I mean, you want to think about cities of the world uh, around which, you know, human civilization rotates. And, you know, you'd think in American terms, you would think of New York City or Washington. Um, you know, in Europe, you think about London and Paris, maybe Berlin. Um, you think in Asian terms, I mean, you think about Beijing. So you think about a number of large cities that do control um economies and control world politics. So think of Ur Ur of Chaldeans like that 4,000 years ago. It was an incredible city at that time. So we know that the story that we're about to read, which is a 4,000 year old story, uh, takes place in a place that was at that point in time, they captured the attention of the entire world. We also know, let's talk about the religion of the city because that's an important part of the story. Uh, that that we know that the religion, uh, that the city itself was dominated by a huge temple tower, and it's called a ziggurat. And a ziggurat is kind of like a pyramid, but unlike the pyramids in Egypt, I mean, this pyramid would have had at the top of it a housing place for the gods and for the priests to go. It would have been about 150 feet high, and it was dedicated to the god Nanar, also known as the god Sin, Uh, who was the moon god. And that tells you something about the religion of Ur of the Chaldeans 4,000 years ago. The religion would have been what we now call a naturalistic polytheism. So when I say that, you think about naturalism, and that has to do with nature. And, uh, you know, so what people would do, they would have, they would have put godlike properties onto nature. So the moon god was supreme in their pantheon, but they would have also worshiped, you know, the god of the rivers and the god of the trees. And you're getting my idea, the god of the wind and, and so forth. So all natural things they encountered had in their religious understanding some kind of a divine thing that was behind it. And so they worshiped the gods of all these things. So this god Nanar, or god Sin, the moon god, was the principal god of Ur, and the ziggurat that was at the center of the city served the many classes of priests who ministered and worshiped there. Now, the name Terah, so we get back to Abram's dad, Terah, because that's where our story begins with this man named Terah and his family. Uh, Terah can actually, it's a derivation, which means one who worships the moon. And and, and we know something about Terah because about 500 years after this event that we read about here, we now come to the time of a man named Joshua, and Joshua writes about this. Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, Uh, Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river, that is beyond the Euphrates, and worshiped other gods. So in other words, 
Abraham uh, grew up in a family where naturalistic polytheism and the worship of the moon god, Nanar, that was the religion that he was raised in. So you've got to understand that at some point in time in the story that we're about to read, there's got to be a conversion story in there because somewhere Abraham went from that to worshiping but one God. So you got to understand that when he made the transition, he not only made that transition, but a great part of humanity from then on transitioned following him. Do you understand how significant what we're about to read actually is? This is a moment in which the history of the earth will never be the same. So here we have, you know, in this vibrant city, which has a naturalistic polytheistic religion, you have this man named Terah and his three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Uh, they would have had uh, been a a family that was comfortable with magic, with superstition, even with sacred prostitution, sexual deviance, multiple religious beliefs, all of that. And then we come to verse 31. Let me read it again because I've read it before. Let me draw your attention to it again. It says, Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran. Now Haran had died. Uh, His grandson and Sarah his daughter-in-law his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. So, you know, they're on a pilgrimage, I think, although the passage doesn't say exactly why they left that prosperous city. I mean, I guess we could give every number of reasons, but I have every reason in the world for believing that uh, there's a religious pilgrimage going on here, and I'm going to explain that as, as we go on. But let's just simply understand that. Terah moves with his family. Uh, They're going away to Canaan, and Canaan is basically where you'd find Israel today. So they're going to Canaan, and that's where they're thinking they're going to end up. They start by going north because they're following the trade route, and the trade route has also been called the Fertile Crescent. You don't go straight to the west, which they could have done, but they would have crossed an inhospitable desert, and they'd likely have died there. So all traders would have followed a fertile crescent. There's a a fertile, uh, just a crescent shape where people would go north and then come back down south alongside of the Mediterranean Sea. If you can, in your mind's eye, picture a map of that region which ends up in Israel. So they're moving in that direction. They've begun to go. So they're following the trade route, and somewhere along the trade route, at the very top of the Fertile Crescent, they come to a city called Haran. And they're in Haran, and we're not told why, but there, Terah aborts his journey. He gets to Haran, and he just settles there. He says, this is going to be my new home. I know we were going to Canaan. We ain't going anymore. We're going to stop here, and this is the end of our journey. So that's what we have. So uh, no doubt, you know, Terah must have felt that he just didn't want to carry on with the journey. Now, I'll say this about Haran, and we don't know a lot about Haran, but we do know that the the wealth of Ur of the Chaldeans. Remember, that's the city, that's the largest city on earth at the time, and it's the trade capital of the world, lots of stuff that's going on. And since Haran is not that far away, you've got to believe that the, the wealth from Ur of the Chaldeans had transferred to Haran. They also were prospering because of the prosperity of Ur. So, you know, uh, uh, Terah must have said, look, I I don't want to get poorer. I'm going to stay right here. And he felt at home there. Years later, when we get to Genesis 24, a lot of chapters on in Genesis, we find that the family of Terah is still there in Haran. They've made that then their their permanent home. So this is an aborted journey in which they ended up there. Well, I mentioned all this, and we we need to ask ourselves, because you know where the story is going to go. The story is going to go to a place where at one point in time, God speaks to Abram. That is, the one God, the creator God, the one God that says, I alone am God, and I am the creator of all things. There's not a God of the moon. I am the creator of the moon. There's not a God of the rivers. I am the one who created the rivers. In other words, this, 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 this 
massive shift in thinking, this conversion that you have to the one true God, where did that occur? Uh, when did Abram actually encounter him? So let me take you uh, to a passage much later in the Bible, in the New Testament, in Acts 7, verses 2 and 3, and there we read, The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So I'm going to assume that's correct. That would mean that God first encountered Abram when Abram was in Ur of the Chaldeans. And you got to understand something about the God that we find in the Bible. I mean, the God in the Bible just doesn't come and speak and you have a conversation with him and you forget about it the next day. I mean, later on in the next book after Genesis, we get to Exodus. And when God speaks to all of Israel, the earth shakes, the mountain trembles, there's fire coming down and the people are terrified. And they say, if God keeps speaking, we're all going to die. In other words, the God of the Bible is different from every other encounter we have ever had. So you've got to believe that however it was that God spoke to Abram, this was such a profound moment for Abram that everything shifted at that point in time. And you've got to believe that he wasn't quiet. And the first people that he would have told are probably not his work colleagues, but would have been his family members. Terah would have heard from his son the encounter that he had with the creator of all things. Everything had now shifted. And so I've got to believe that when Terah takes the whole family and they go on a pilgrimage, it's because, well, we get to chapter 12 of Genesis, where it says, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, that somehow Abram had convinced his father and the rest of the family, we need to go. Now, clearly one brother had already died, Nonetheless, he still has another brother and they've got others and they all decide they're going to go on this pilgrimage together. They're going to follow the creator everywhere he goes. And that now, suddenly we get a picture. Somewhere halfway through the journey, uh, Terah, the father, the, the patriarch of the family says, we've gone far enough. We've gone on this ridiculous journey as far as I'm going to take it. I don't know what lies at the other end of this journey, but I'm stopping now. We've come to a city where I can make a living, where I can prosper. Maybe it wasn't what Ur was, but it's a good enough city and we're going to settle here and our family is going to end up here. Now, we're not told, you know, was there at, you know, a, a dispute that erupted in the family? We don't know anything about that because the Bible's quiet about this. But somehow along the way, Abram and his wife, Sarah, And then also Abram's nephew, that is the son of his deceased brother, his name is Lot, um, says, I'm going with Abram. So they decide they're going to carry on this journey and follow it through right to the other end. So that's the drama that we have. The one God speaks to Abram and takes him out of the culture, which was the leading culture of the world, and leads him to the land that he's going. So that's the whole idea. So let's stop at this point in time and ask ourselves, what do we learn so far? Well, the first thing that I want to learn is that whenever God speaks, and we get this from the story of Abram, remember what we learn from Abram or Abraham is that there's something we can learn about the one true God. And it's so profound, it's so earth shattering that throughout 4,000 years, There have been followers of Abraham's God who have always said, this is such a profound moment that we can't take our eyes off of this thing. So what do we learn? Well, the first thing we learn is that when the God who created all things first encounters any human being, that he calls that human being to abandon something. Listen to what Jesus would say 2,000 years after Abraham. He would say, if anyone comes after me, and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. In other words, Jesus said, look, here's what I can tell you. I am the son of God who has entered into the world. I'm the one that Abraham was hoping would come. We'll get to that. I'm that one. Abraham had his sight set on my coming. 
And I'm telling you the very same thing that happened to Abraham. If you're going to follow after me, you're going to have to abandon family and follow me. So here's what I know about encountering the true God. Whenever you encounter the true God, you just don't have a discussion with him. You don't just have a, an intellectual aha. Uh, it's not just like that. It's something far more profound. It's something we call conversion. Everything changes from that point in time. God calls everyone who comes to him to abandon something. It may be the abandonment of a previous religion, which is exactly what happened to Abraham. He abandons the gods that were the gods of his father, and I have to assume the gods of his grandfather and great-grandfather, the family gods that you simply took for granted. Abraham abandons them, and this is true today. Um, I, I'm going to say this. Uh, if you uh, belong to a religion that's polytheistic and you come to Abraham's God, he demands that you abandon your previous religion. This is absolutely essential. Abandonment of previous religion. It can mean the abandonment of cherished family ties. See, I, I know a lot of people uh, who have come to Christ and come to see the one true God and recognize that Jesus is God's only son sent into the world. And once they have done that, um, members of the family have put an imperative on their lives. You give up on that new idea or you're out of the family and you might even be persecuted and die. And I've known people who have simply said, it doesn't matter. I've encountered the one true God and he means for me to abandon everything I hold. If it even is my family, I'll do that. It may also be simply the abandonment of a privileged way of life. Um, you know, Abraham must have had a privileged life uh, when he was in Ur of the Chaldeans. We get that sense because even when he gets to Canaan, he's still got a lot of wealth that he's dragging along beside him. So he clearly left, I mean, very lucrative business opportunities to go on this wild adventure following the one God. So there's that. So whenever God calls someone, he may call us to abandon a privileged way of life. I know many people who have, after they've come to Christ, been called upon to take an economic hit because of their commitment to the one true God. Well, the one true God demands that. See, that's a part of the story. But it's always, no matter how it is that we encounter the one true God, there is an abandonment that's true of everyone. And it's the abandonment of my own self-will, my own pride, and my own sin. Yeah, sin. See, God establishes his laws. He's the creator. Um, he created us. He has laws whereby we would live. We've broken those laws. Now God says, you've got to abandon your law-breaking ways to come to me. You've got to submit to me, and you've got to abandon your own choices. That's always the case. And so uh, there's always that conversionism that's there. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor who pastored during the time of Adolf Hitler. At one point in time, he had left Nazi Germany, and Bonhoeffer was always against Hitler and against the Nazis, believing that they were the incarnation of evil. His life was already in danger, and he had already found a place in the United States, and he could have stayed there, pastored a church there, and gone on. But he believed that God had called him to go back and minister to the German people because they were living under evil, and it was time to call them to repent. The choice that Bonhoeffer made eventually cost him his life as the Nazis um, hung him in a, a concentration camp. But here's what Bonhoeffer wrote before he died. He said, when Christ bids a man to follow him, he bids him to come and die. That is, he bids him to let go of his life and to let go of all the things of this earth that we hold dear and to follow him on a wild adventure and to go where he leads us to go. See, Abraham's story is not just the story of a person who reasoned his way through the world in which he lived and said, look, the river is just a river, you know, and the moon is just a moon, and the trees are just trees. They're not deities. 
but there is a creator who made these things. It's not the story of an intellectual adventure. It's the story of an encounter, and it's the story of conversion. It's the story of abandonment of the past and giving themselves to a new life. You can't understand the story of Abraham until you come to that. Now, let me say this. It is true that one half of the earth's population and more hold to the God of Abraham. But having said that, I'm not saying that half of the earth's population understand truly what Abraham's life signifies. Abraham's life signifies that we abandon the past and we put our hope into that to which Abraham put his hope in, the coming Messiah, the one sent by God, who is Jesus himself. It is the story of Abraham that leads us eventually to abandon all that we have and say, not my way, but thine be done. That's where this story will eventually go. So yeah, this story is earth shattering. It causes us to reconsider all of our priorities and everything we thought we knew and what we thought was true and to look at it again and see something that has shaken the earth. Let it shake us as well. So that's what I wanna say. God's calling is always a calling that invites us to come to him with a condition. You see, when we begin to read in Genesis chapter 12, notice what it says. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That in and of itself is a grand thing, but please understand, God was making Abram promises. He's saying to Abram, you see everything you've got? It ain't nothing. I'm offering you more. I'll talk about that next week. God says, I'm offering you more. But here, God also says there's a condition to the promise you're going to have to abandon everything that you hold dear to in order to get something greater. So what's this story really all about? Well, it's the story of faith. It's a story of someone who says, yep, I'll abandon everything because I believe that what I give up is not as significant as what I get. And that's the entire story. Um, God does demand that we give up everything to him but God then in the end gives us far more than we ever had. And that's the tragedy of the unbelieving world that we live in. There are lots of people in this world who have traded in the poverty of the present for the riches of the world to come. And that is, they've grabbed a hold of little trinkets and things that can't mean anything, and they've given up their eternal destiny. Abraham's life will teach us to reconsider all those values. We'll have to ask ourselves, what's ultimately important? What is it that I need to hang on to? And if you listen hard to Abraham, he'll say there's one thing you need. You need to hang on to the one true creator God who in the end sent his son into this world. That's the most valuable thing you'll ever possess. And so follow me on this wild journey as we follow the wild journey of Abraham and see if we don't come to the same conclusions. God is saying, leave everything you have, come and follow me. That's Jesus' words to us as well. Hey, thanks for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada. And let me say this to you before I leave. If you've never had that opportunity to say to God, yep, I'm a sinner. Yeah, I've been clinging to things that are in opposition to you and I don't wanna do so anymore. I wanna abandon everything and surrender my life to Jesus. You might wanna say this very prayer. Simply say, Lord Jesus, I know you're the Son of God. I know you are the one true God who has come into the world and you are the hope of Abraham. I now ask you, forgive my sins. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe that you come to give me a new life. I gladly surrender all that I have and entrust my life into your hands. Pray that way. Watch what God does for you. Hey, God bless you. Have a wonderful day.
Thank you for watching today. And I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.